All right. James 1, 12. Y'all can read it. Like I said, I didn't write it exactly. Um, blessed is the man that endures his trials. Blessed meaning he's going to receive great gain and benefit from enduring his trials. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him because he would have been perfected and made complete, which is why he's going to receive the crown of life in the first place. Because clearly James said, blessed is the man who endures his trials because he's going to get the crown of life. The only way he's going to get the crown of life for enduring his trials is because he endured and endured had the necessary results and effects that it was that was that was the whole point in it being designed in the first place. He was made perfect and complete, which is what the trials were set up for. He allowed the cross to work in him. That's why he's going to get the crown of life. Okay? If these trials are not endured and dealt with the godly way, you will not receive the crown because you were a stumbling block to your own sanctification. The crown is for everyone, but it is our responsibility to lay a hold of it by pursuing it through obedience and purging. All promises are conditional. It's dependent upon you. This is not a ride. Actually, no. Christianity is a ride on a truck just chilling, but that's only if you're abiding in Jesus. There's a different kind of ride that you can take with God, which is believing that he's done everything. You have to do absolutely nothing. You have nothing to contribute to the faith anymore. You don't have to comply with anything, and you're just breezing on by, not changing at all, not being sanctified, not being cleansed or purged of anything. You stay the same Christian you were 10 years ago with your born-again Holy Spirit that I'm sure is very disappointed by you 10 years later. So... Next scripture, James chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. <clears throat> Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed by the treasures of his heart. When these lusts are acted upon, causing one to commit sin, once the lust has been completed and successful in causing the person to sin or stumble, it brings death. There's many different manners of death. may not be physical, literal death. It could be, but for the most part, most likely spiritual death cuts off your communion i mean i'm sure a lot of us can attest to the fact that every time you masturbate it takes like a month for you to even get back in the presence of god i've personally experienced that it is super hard i don't know what it is by that specific sin but when you commit sexual immorality it is so hard for you to get back in the spirit it's like you took 15 steps back and now you gotta like press press like press you know so um yeah so this was pretty easy. I wrote the scripture down. So the problem with sin is, as a Christian, you clearly still have sin in your heart. You do. It's filthy. Especially if you spend most of your time watching television shows and movies you have no business watching. Filling your mind and your spirit up with maybe just stupid comedy, like I did last night. Zach Kalifanakis, he was freaking hilarious, but it was just kind of like, okay, it's too much. But maybe you're feeding your spirit just with maybe just idleness. It may not even be sinful what you're watching. It's just kind of like a waste of time. You're not redeeming the time. You could be using this time to be in the word, building your spirit up, spending intimate moments with God because Satan's about to shoot you in the next five minutes, but you want to watch a TV show. Or you just want to spend countless hours on YouTube for no apparent reason. That's not going to contribute to your salvation in any way, shape, or form. Like you don't have a soul to lose. Things that we do out of stupidity. So everybody has lust in their heart. It could be different kinds. I don't know what it could be for y'all. Um, maybe for me, some self-exposure. Playing the Sims game. After the Lord has already told me it's witchcraft and I should be playing it, which I have not played it. It's just that somebody had in their house recently and I saw it and I had memories come back of how fun it was. And it was there. I felt it. You can bear witness in your heart when something's in your heart. They ain't got no business being there. So it was tempting. I didn't do it, though. Playing a Sims game or let me see. Different sins in the heart. Killing somebody. Being so unforgiving and resentful towards someone has done who has done you wrong. It's in there. Satan just needs the right opportunity to stir that up in you. And everybody wants to blame Satan. Satan can plant some things. That's true. He does plant things. But it's your responsibility to fill yourself up with the word of God to burn it out. Because it can be burned out. Satan can plant whatever he wants in your mind and your heart. But as long as you're in the word, it's always going to be obliterated. Trust me. So... All he needs is the right opportunity 
to kind of stir the desire that's already in your heart in you for you to act upon it. So everybody has sin in the heart. So if you read that scripture and you read how it says, everyone is tempted by the lust of his own heart. So we can't blame the devil. We can't blame God. You can only blame you because if you were tempted to do anything, it's because you already had this, the desire in your heart to do it in the first place. So the issue we should be looking at is how do I get rid of it? I can't deny that it's here. Nobody should be ashamed about it. I mean, it's disgusting. Yeah, being ashamed in the sense that it's not of God and you should abhor it. Like, yeah, be ashamed in that sense. But condemnation, shame. No, I think every Christian should confess their sins to one another. You should be very open with other Christians about what's in your heart. I was just telling somebody the other day, I had thoughts of killing someone in my heart because I was still holding resentment against them because of what they did to me. So, and I told her that because like, she's just a God ordained friend and she said something obviously that encouraged me and stuff. But no, I'm just saying, a lot of us have these things in our heart. Hatred and anger is murder. Even if you want to take it a step further and like you've had thoughts of actually killing the person. Okay, well, that's in your heart. So now that we know that it does not take much for Satan to stir that up somehow, causing you to act upon it, because trust me, the way I see it, I, I'm rolling with Jesus on this one, okay, with everything. But how he said that, you know, if it's in the heart, honey, you already did it. You know, that's how I see things. Whether you actually, whether sin was successful in getting you to act upon it or not does not matter. The fact that it's there is what you should be very concerned and worried about. Because if the opportunity ever presented itself, Satan could actually get you to do that. Sex. It does not matter. If it's in there, you may not be in the proper atmosphere for it to actually happen. But because it's still in there, Satan could set up something to actually demonstrate, not demonstrate, um, actually manifest that. So what we need to focus on is not denying that it's there. It is there. It's in your filthy little heart, okay? It's nothing to be embarrassed about. We all have crazy stuff going on in here. What you need to focus on in question is how can I get rid of it? It's here. So if it does get manifested and I am going to be enticed by it, how can I savor this always being lured into this and I always feel compelled to yield I'll be resisting it, you know. And, you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> this is counterfeit false Christianity to continue teaching that Christians are always going to be tempted by sin. If you're tempted by sin, your heart is defiled. Scripture clearly says that. So, no, you're trying to get to the point where you're not tempted by anything. If you're still tempted by things in the world, the world is still in you, okay? If it's that weak for you to not look at some booty, because you just tempted to go have sex with a girl or call her up or something. If it's, if it's still tempting to you to be around people who smoke and weed, that's because you still want to smoke. You can't tip me with no crack. I don't smoke crack. I don't want it. I want absolutely nothing to do with crack. It makes you ugly and it's just disgusting. So you can't tip me with something I don't want. You can only be tempted by what you do want, as scripture says. It's already in your heart. That's why it's hard for you to be around it. You feel like you got to resist it, resist it all the time. I don't want to be resisting things like this for the rest of my life. I want to get to the point where I can't, I'm not tempted. I don't want it. It can be all around me for 24 hours and I'm just going to be sitting here like this because I don't want nothing to do with it. So that's the point that Christians need to get to. You have a lot of Christians who they just don't know any better or religious people who are blinded are teaching temptation like it's always going to be something the Christian will deal with for the rest of his life. And you just got to know every time you go through that, bro, you know, I know it's hard for us men, you know, it's Christian brothers, you know, the sisters just be dressing all iman. Honey, not saying that a sister in Christ should dress that way, but every time I hear a man talk like that, the first thing I think about is you have a heart full of perversion because there are men out here. There are Christian men who don't even look at women like that. If that bothered you, God forbid God sends you on the streets to go preach to a prostitute because you won't even be able to do it properly because you're going to be looking at her skirt, you know? So there are men of God out here who can look at a woman who's dressed that way and not have any of that in his heart about her. He could correct her. He could rebuke her. You know, he could minister. So he could do what he needs to do because now he has Christ manifest in his heart. He doesn't desire, not only does he not desire a woman like that, but he doesn't even have lust in his heart to see another human being in that manner. There are men out there like that. That should be your goals, Christian man. Every time I hear a Christian man talk about that, I'm just like, yeah, you pretty much expose yourself that you still have lust in your heart. Every time you say something like that. 
Oh, I think you dressing a little bit too provocatively. Oh, I think you look a little like. I think you need to read the word too. I think we, we should both read the word. <laughs> like, because it should not be that much of a distraction for you. And if it is, something's wrong. So like I said, um, no. Christians are not going to be struggling with this for the rest of their life. Unless they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not eating their manna if they are dealing with that. If you're constantly yielding or feel compelled and just pulled and just, oh, oh God. you know, if that's what you're dealing with, it's in your heart somewhere. It may be buried up in there. It may be in the deep treasures of your heart, like pirate ship type stuff. Like it would take a, you probably got it like guarded up. Like if, you, if your heart was like a movie scene or something or like a place in a movie, it'd probably be guarded up with like some high fences and you need like the mysterious forbidden key on the other side of the ocean to go and unlock it. And then even once you unlock it and you find the treasure chest, you still need like some magical words to really open it. So it could really be in the deep treasures of your heart, but it's still there. God can see it. And it's enough. That one sin in that treasure chest, honey, I'm telling you, if the opportunity presented itself, that coin way at the bottom of that treasure chest would rise up like this, <laughs> like a magnet. Ish. Okay, so like I said, we have it. How do I get rid of it, Brandy? How do I get rid of this hatred? How do I get rid of this lust? You read the word of God. The great thing about the word of God is it's freaking living. It's not a book. It's not just a book. This thing has the ability to do so many things within you at once when you read it. It's insane. It's powerful. It's alive and it's active. It's a cleansing agent. When you read the word, if you are feeding your spirit and your heart with those things, because Jesus is the word, and he's also the light, it will burn completely, diminish and obliterate all that crap that's in your heart. If Christians still have defilement in their heart, they're not reading the word of God. I can promise you that they're not. They're not reading it. They're not. And if they are reading it, like James says, they're probably just being a hearer and not a doer. They're not committing themselves to it. They're not letting it have the, the work that it's supposed to, uh, they're supposed to do in your heart when you read it. That's the way to do it. That's pretty much easy. That's what I wrote down. Yeah. So how to get rid of it. I don't want to read the scripture and get stressed out, <laughs> you know, and condemn myself because I, once you read it, you're going to bear witness that you do have something in your heart that shouldn't be there. So let's go straight to the solution. Read the word of God. Fill the word of God up with your heart. Um, fill the word of God. Fill your heart up with the word of God, your spirit, your mind, renewing your mind. And the word of God, honestly, it does it alone. You don't, you don't have to make the Bible do anything. It's a cleansing agent. Okay. The blood of Jesus is all up in that thing. As long as you get it up in here, it's going to erase all of that stuff. And you will be abiding in Christ because abiding in Christ is you being in the word. You're reading the word, okay? Abiding in Christ, you will uh, you begin to manifest of uh, the sun more. So all of that is going to go away. So don't condemn yourself because you're thinking about killing that person who um, stole your girlfriend from you years ago. Still in there. I'm serious. I get real with the Lord. I journal to him. I hate this person. I have thoughts about killing them. I've actually expressed to God how much just different ideas that I've had about doing to this person. And um, yeah, I know it sounds morbid, but you're his child. Like, same thing with your children. Wouldn't you rather your child tell you and confess something like that to you than actually try to go do it or just hide from you all the time? No, I want my child to tell me every single thing. And God is the best father to talk to about it because he actually listens to you. He already knows it's there. So he actually honors it that you trust him enough to even come to him and express that much. He's going to listen and then he's going to speak back to you. And all of his words are life. So his words are definitely going to obliterate that as well. But I do. I journal to God, honey. I, my, my stuff be so graphic and descriptive when I'm angry. It's just like, I think the angels just be like, oh my God, like, what are you reading? <laughs> Did she send that up here? Or like, you know how they say the prayers, they come up as incense or smoke in heaven. I bet they just, <laughs> that girl is wicked. <laughs> like, we definitely need the blood for that one. <laughs> you mad for real, you know, but no, I'm being silly, but it's all of us, you know, it's, it's not going to run him away. The Bible says that we don't do anything that surprises God. So you need to confess that to him. Scripture actually says it, um, 
it's not just about venting or just getting it out. It's just, it's it breaks Satan's power over you when you confess things like that. Now, when it comes to Christians, you want to confess it to the right people because everybody that you tell stuff like that to, they may slander you. They may go back and tell somebody else. So, you know, they may try to make you look, I don't know about her because she told me that she was thinking about killing people, but she a Christian. And I don't know. Let me not say nothing to you because she going to try to kill me. <laughs> you know? So be wise with which Christians you tell it to because everybody's not an encourager. Everybody's not understanding. And everybody's not discerning because some people, I got sisters in Christ, when I email them stuff like that, they can discern. Girl, that wasn't even you, that wasn't even you speaking. That was a spirit. Okay. And they stay right where they at. They don't run away scared. You know, so everybody's not like that. Everybody's not discerning. They don't have discerning of spirits to be able to distinguish between you speaking in a spirit or when a spirit is oppressing you and putting thoughts like that into your mind or, you know, not really understanding of different situations that you've been through that have caused, you know, Satan to kind of come into your heart like that. Every, some people just have a spirit of grace. They can minister to you and take, you know, take a part in that healing of what happened to you. So that's not everybody. So be wise of who you talk to. When it comes to God, when you confess that to God, not only is it obedience to scripture, it's, it's like a spiritual, uh, something spiritual that takes place when you confess something to God. It really does break Satan's power, the hold that he had on you, off of you. Because the Bible says, you know, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins. So it's still a sin. You didn't do it, but it's in your heart. So um, the fact that you have confessed that you feel that way in your heart to God about something or somebody, even about yourself, you know, he's able to forgive you now. It's not that he didn't know it was there. He was just waiting on you <laughs> to come and talk to him about it. And um, that's really the only way you're going to be released from feelings and, and emotions like that anyway. You have to confess that to God. And honey, I, I would say, yeah, get descriptive with it. Because honestly, I don't like the feeling of talking to God about something. And I feel like just because he's holy, I don't say anything to disrespect him. But I don't like feeling like I still have to be repressed in how I talk to him. And even though I came and I laid it down. I took a breadcrumb back because I don't feel like I got the opportunity to just really express how I really feel about this. I've had, I can tell y'all some stories. I've had times where, I'm not going to say who it was. It was somebody, but this person just hurt me so bad. And I was in my room screaming, I'm going to kill him. I'm serious. I was talking to God. Like, I know he was listening, but I was screaming, I'm going to kill him. I hate him. Like, I'm just screaming and just... Ah, ah, you know and then after i was done i just kind of felt the holy spirit like are you finished <laughs> are you okay <laughs> can we talk now <laughs> you know now that you've got that out let me give you some counsel you know so honey i say go all out honey scream don't hit the walls if, unless you got money to pay for it you know i wouldn't hit the walls or anything but scream talk to if you if your thing is writing write it down Write all of it down. I mean, if it's hatred, honey, get it out. God, I can't stand them. I want you to avenge me. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, I would avenge myself. <laughs> like, I need your strength, Lord. Like, this is what's in my heart. I'm so angry. You know, like, don't hold nothing back from the Father. Let it all out. The little piece that you leave in, Satan still has to kind of work with. You don't want to give him any room or any darkness to work with. Tell God everything. Don't worry about how he's going to think about it or if it's too, everything has to be said in a Christian. Like, no, it doesn't. God is raw and not cut. He sees everybody for who they really are. You may as well just confess it to him. Was really in that dirty little heart of yours, okay? Don't be trying to Christianize it because no, okay, this is the ministry that Jesus has, um, that he's founded, okay? He was healing lepers. So I think he's used to touching and being familiar with dirty things and just... I really don't want to deal with that type of stuff. So, yeah, it's in there. He died so he can get rid of it. You know, it's nothing is hidden, you know, before him. So just confess all of it. Everything. Absolutely everything to him. Um, yes. And also, you know, it, um, a lot of us do love the Father, and, um, you know, Satan, it's, it's literally just a tug of war for us. The enemy's pulling us in this direction. God's pulling us in this direction, and you really do love him, and you want to submit to the Father in heart, not just learning and memorizing, but there, it doesn't really get in here. So um, whatever your motivation may be, just make sure that it gets done. So 
if your motivation is I love God and I want to serve him, he deserves the best that he can get from me. I want to, I don't want any hindrances, you know, or anything serving as a hindrance uh, in our relationship. So I have to get this out of my heart, whatever this thing is, you know, and, you know, so let that, let that be your motivation, you know, get rid of the sin for that reason. <clears throat> um, this yellow one, council, I wrote down. Okay, I'll, I'll read this one. Brandy. These are for me. Personally, that I feel. Um, because one of my desires, as every Christian's desire should be, and main concerns is just holiness. Because I feel like that's just an aspect of God a lot of people forget and just keep denying for some reason. You know, God is love. He's all those good things. And he is sovereign. And he does speak through many things that are secular and all that good stuff. But... People don't like to acknowledge God's holiness at all. Read the Old Testament. If you want to get holied up and see what kind of God he really is, what kind of covenant God he really is, and how serious and sacred he is, you need to go read the Old Testament, okay? So, this is James 1, verse 27. Pure religion and holiness. The Bible says defilement or undefilement. I just put holiness. Pure religion, which if you look up, the Greek word for religion in that verse, I think is just um, ceremonious worship. So it's not religion in the sense of tradition and what we know religion to be like church people, apostate Christianity. It's not that type of religion. Religion in that text in the Greek is um, holiness, consecration of people set apart and, you know, um, unto God, you know, worship, your lifestyle of worship, a true holy Christian, holiness, okay? That's religion. Pure religion and holiness before God is to manifest the nature. What well, actually says to, uh, I think it says to care for the widows, visit the, the fatherless and the widows and stuff. So I basically just interpreted that because you have to like read God's heart and his character into the scripture that you're reading. Because obviously holiness is not just going to visit orphans and widows. You have to see what is James really trying to say. So the fact that he says that pure holiness and pure religion the essence of Christianity, if it's visiting abandoned people or fatherless people or widowers, you know, he's basically saying the heart of Christ really cares about people that are broken. So the essence of, of, of Christianity, what I get from James 1.27 is to manifest the nature and the character of Jesus to those who are poor in spirit, broken people, sinners. Don't even have to be in a special category, I mean, because there's broken Christians, you know, but the heart of Christ, pure religion and pure undefilement, pure holiness is just having the heart of Christ towards people. When you see somebody hurting or broken who needs healing inside and God has given you the gift of discernment and the gift of healing, the word of knowledge, and he'll tell you what that person is struggling with or why they're hurting, you know, you're able to minister to them. They're going to be like, how did you know that? <laughs> like, and I just like, it's God, bro. Like, it's the Lord. He just told me everything. Like, I know your whole life story. I got you. Let's pray right now. You know, so um, these are what the gifts are for. Gifts are awesome. Spiritual gifts are awesome if you use them for the right reasons. They're, they're for the world. They're for the edification of the body of Christ. So they're for the people. Word of knowledge is the best gift to have. I freaking love that gift. Like, when God just tells me random stuff about people, there's no way I would have known. They're never going to tell you that because they're embarrassed about it. They're just really shut up people. You know, they're not gonna, they don't know you like that. They're not going to confide in you, but God will reveal it. He'll expose their hearts to you. Or maybe he'll show you in a dream or something. And there's nothing more. I cannot, uh, I can't explain to you what it does to the heart. Because God has done it to me a couple times when, when you encounter somebody, it could just be through their gift. It may not even be personal between y'all who knows you, I mean, knows you, you know, like Hagar said, was it Hagar? The God who sees me, that's, that's, what, that's really what she was saying, like, wow, like, how do you know that? And like, it went deep, you know, whatever God told you, I mean, y'all know how that feels. You've probably been in church and had somebody who was a true prophet, you know, pretty much bring some stuff up and you were just crying in church, like, man, that's me. <laughs> My mama died when I was nine. You talking about me? Like, oh my God, how did he know that? Oh my God, like I really needed that word from God. Like, yeah, y'all be doing that. Like, I almost cried when 
with y'all. Like, <laughs> it's true though. Like it's healing is a beautiful ministry. It's not just physical healing, but um, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. You just say the right thing. God will give you a word of knowledge about that by, about that person. You just say the right thing that just <laughs> it just goes right to the core. And you know what I think it is? I don't. <sighs> know how to explain because he's done it with me like he just spoke to me he just said something or i was believing a lot about him and like i'll read something in a book and he was directly like it penetrated my heart because by rhema word he was speaking through me but it was christian literature just a, a book that was written years ago but you know it's alive so i guess it's just the fact that um maybe we feel like god has forsaken us or maybe that darkness has been in there that pain has been there for so long you don't think anybody would ever care or really understand what you feel inside or the core of who you are, the core of your personality and which, you know, what happened to you. And when God just gives somebody a word of knowledge like that and they speak it, it's kind of like, I, I think it's a mixture of a lot of different things for us. I think it's like, wow, so God does see me. He does love me. And, and I also think it's, wow, they understand me. Somebody finally gets me. I don't have to spend countless hours trying to explain myself to get you to understand me and then work on getting you to accept me or vice versa, you know, maybe doing the other one first, maybe getting you, getting you to accept me to the point where I can confide in you and I don't have to do all of that. All God had to do was give somebody a word of knowledge and you came to me and you gave me the right word at the right time and it does countless things. We've all experienced it in different ways. It's amazing. I don't know how he does it. Like maybe he'll download something and i'll share it with y'all i really don't know but i'm just like man it just does something it's like you just had this wall on your heart and he just kind of came and burst it but he did it with like <laughs> that's how he does it it's like god when he touches you he's not like he's like and you'd be like lord what you doing like you know that's how god touches you he just gives that soft gentle just like i see you <laughs> i hear you you know, and all he got to do is say something. You know, God is like the best smooth talker. He don't talk a lot. When he does, if you don't know his voice, he may not. But when he does speak, it's like the, oof, who is that? <laughs> like the heart just got stolen. Like he just won the heart completely, honey. Like it, it's gone. Like he, he's the lover. He's the lover from that point on. So definitely. Um. Pure religion and pure holiness is manifesting the nature of Christ to people, to a world, a broken world who needs him. That's basically what James, what James is telling them. He gave like examples. That's not the totality of what uh, pure religion is that James listed. I think he just kind of gave like a description, like visiting the fatherless, you know, tending to the widowers, you know, obviously that's not it. It's more than that he's giving an example of God's character and a picture of what Jesus cares about, like the kind of person that he is in his heart. He cares about people who are lonely. Basically is what James is saying. A widower, she lost her husband or, um, or the husband lost his wife. So if that's what pure religion is, then obviously God is, he's concerned about the person that's lonely now. They done lost their soulmate. They were in love. You know, you get attached to people, especially old people. There's people who die right after their spouse because they can't handle the heart. They literally die from heartbreak. Like it's a scientific fact. You can't die from heartbreak. I don't know if your body or your mind just goes into like a state of depression where it just shuts down, but that actually happens. Their spouse dies and they're just kind of like, they're lonely. Very, very lonely. My grandfather's like that. My, um, my dad's dad. Uh, God actually gave me a dream about my grandpa. And he had a picture of my grandmother on the wall in the dream. The walls were white. There was nothing in the house. Just my grandpa sitting at a table and he just looks so lonely and he had a picture of my grandma my grandmother died i'm about to be 24 she died when mama was pregnant with me so my grandpa is still in love with my grandmother he had a wife after that that just passed away in 2003 2000 no 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 that was my uncle last year i think it was last year that she passed away so my grandpa was married for 20 plus years after my grandmother died and he's still in love with her to this day and every time i spend time with my grandpa and i just be listening to him talk he always talk about my grandmother and just how i remind uh, him of her and i guess we had like similar um personality traits he said she was real strong-minded like you and 
yeah, y'all got that bold personality. Like, y'all just say what y'all want to say. You don't really think about it. No filter, you know. But he also said she's sweet like you, too. So I was like, man, I wish I could have met her. Like, a Granny Brandy? What? <laughs> I bet she was so cool. Like, I would have loved to meet my grandma, but I don't know. <laughs> but um, I was just like, you know, old people's love really just inspires me. Like, they got something. They hold on to something. I had a chance to lay a hold of something that a lot of people do not know how to attain today when it comes to just real authentic love. Like, I think he said he met my grandmother when he was 17. She was 14. And he was, you know, they're old school. So they're like country. My family is country. But so can you just imagine, like, you know how they used to do it? Maybe just court them. They get married, like, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Or y'all don't really know each other yet. And he just kind of comes and says he likes you. And then he makes you his wife. And y'all be together for the next 50 years. It actually happened like that. That's crazy. It worked. But yeah, he said my grandmother was 13. 13 or 14. And he was 17. And as soon as he saw her, he liked her. And uh, I think he um, he went to my great-grandmother and said something about it. How he wanted to court my grandma. And I think she said something like, maybe I ain't about to be dating nobody. <laughs> I think like she's. She's too young or something like that. So my grandpa waited on her. I was like, oh my God. I'll be trying not to cry when I listen to my grandpa. But I think he said he waited on her. I think there was, he said there was one lady that he courted. Cause I think, I don't know if my, my grandmother didn't want to date him or it was just due to her mom saying she was too young because 13 and 17, you know, to us, that's like nasty now. It's like you fast. But um, so while he couldn't date her, he ended up dating another woman. I think the girl liked my grandpa and although he was dating her and he was just telling me, he was like, I was with her, but all I could think about was your grandmother. <laughs> he said, and my grandpa, he's such a humble, like gentleman. Like my grandpa is the type of man that you would have loved to date. He's very sweet, very respectful. Like I'm gonna have to get him on camera one, um, one day, but just the way he was talking about it. I said, so you dissed the papa? I said, you didn't like the girl at all? He was just like, you know, uh, <laughs> he was just, I, I just didn't really, you know, uh, feel too much for, he basically was saying in old man, gentleman form, I didn't have any feelings for the girl. My heart was still with your grandmother and I was just kind of waiting on her to kind of get to the right age. <laughs> so I'm going to swoop her up again. I was with this girl for the moment and my heart was just never with her. I forgot how he said it happened, but eventually he did end up getting with my grandmother and he dumped the other chick and yeah so that's how that happened but um yeah that's beautiful but that that actually does happen though when it comes to widowers like i don't know what it feels like i don't ever want to know what it feels like in jesus name but obviously god cares about that a lot that's really big to god he he actually says that a few times in scripture to take care of the make sure you take care of the widows and the widowers because the loneliness that those people feel is not a good feeling i could imagine it would be or it wouldn't be a good feeling and um, Jesus cares, you know, he's your friend. He doesn't want you to feel lonely and just feel like, you know, you don't have a companion. So that's why he really tells the church to, you know, care for the widowers, care for the, they're lonely. They don't have nobody anymore. They done lost their little sunshine or their little, you know, soul mate. And they just kind of by themselves. So, you know, make sure you keep them up in the spirit. And, you know, so that's beautiful. And I guess the fatherless um, abandonment. It just shows you God's character and his heart was really sensitive to him, was his weak spots. When you read scriptures like that, pure religion is this. Pure religion is the essence of God. It's us. It's a demonstration of who he is. So the fact that he cares about stuff like that, it shows you he's a sensitive guy. Jesus is a very sensitive person. He cares about the fatherless because they feel abandoned. People who feel like they don't have anybody to understand them, nobody who really cares for them. God cracks up over that. Like, he's sensitive. Like, that's the ones that he'll run to first, you know. So he says, care for the fatherless. Care for the other widowers. <clears throat> um, I put, to those poor in spirit, lacking in comfort, care, or covering. They may not just have, a, they may just not have a covering, you know. Who are abandoned, forsaken, lonely, and destitute, and, um. I think another reason why Jesus said, I mean, it's obviously his heart, but also those people are very vulnerable to the enemy. You do not want to be 
rejection and abandonment, we already know what those spirits can do. Those spirits are the door openers for many other strong demons. So I can also see why the Lord would say that as well. You really need to care for the fatherless because Satan will come for them people. He will come for them, whether they're children or not. He'll come for people like that. They're very vulnerable to the enemy. You are prey if you are in a state like that where you feel abandoned and just downcast. You don't have nobody. You're lonely and you're just looking for anybody. And Satan will send you the right person too. So God's like, protect these people. Um, and also to have no trace or likeness of the world. This is my favorite. I, mean, I just think it's fun. I love making videos about no more makeup, no more nail polish. And then we just keep discovering together what's not of God. And we just have the opportunity to lay it. That's fun to me. I don't know why. It just is. Because I feel like, I mean, obviously God's the one who put the desire there to be holy. But I just love scriptures like that. Like have no trace. Well, the, the scripture says to be unspotted from the world your religion to be unspotted that means you are not to have any trace or likeness or even any similarity of anything the world does says acts anything of the world don't even wear nothing that look like it don't dress like it don't talk like it like he wants you to be like set apart he wants you to be that christian and when people come around you they're like like every time I go to the nail salon, it is so funny. And I get a pedicure. Every time I get a pedicure, and they used to me coming up in there. They still ask me, no color? No color? <laughs> I was like, I'd be like, no, I don't want any color. No, no color? You don't want no color? I'm like, no. I was like, dang, why is y'all pressing me to get some color on my toes? I'm not worried about these toes. These toes is crusty. I don't want no color on these toes. But every time I go to the nail salon to get a pedicure, no color? You don't want no color? You know, they so cute because they just be, I guess their little culture, like they probably used to doing designs and stuff like that. So to them, it's just like, this comes with it, girl, what you, no color? <laughs> just like, no. So this is how God wants the world to look at us. Obviously, we're not there completely, but the goal is to get to the point where there should be no trace <laughs> of any of the world its trenches and its tentacles are in you still with different things. The key is to get it out. Okay? He don't want it there, period. He hates it. You his and he gets jealous. Okay, so we gotta please the hubby and just get all the world out. <laughs> okay. Um yes, no trace or likeness of the world or its defilement in or upon us. But even looked or act remotely similar to the ways of the world. The goal is to not look. And you know, this goes deep. I wrote this down for me on the pink paper because um, it helps you define in detail just what those things could be, like our mannerisms, a certain etiquette or speech that we may have, like or we may have, like uh, maybe some slang that we picked up in the world that we still kind of have, and you know, we just never really bothered to just really change the way that we speak. You know, so when he says unspotted, he means unspotted. Don't sound like them, like Christian rap. Christian rap artists clearly did not read James 127, because if they had, they wouldn't be producing a lot of music that sounds just like worldly rap music. I mean, some Christians will even go as far as taking the same exact track, the same exact music, and putting Christian lyrics with it. Unspotted, well, paper spotted because my lip, <laughs> but no, completely unspotted. So it's hurtful, it sucks. I think we should kind of make it fun to discover things that we find out are not of God, so that way we can just kind of help each other in a fun way, not a rebuking. You shouldn't be wearing that chokers is bondage. Oh, and look, look at you, not like that. I think we should kind of get to a point where we can just kind of like study it together and just kind of bring it together and just you know bring it to each other together be like okay you should get excited because holiness should excite you and um if you don't have the desire in you already i found that if i don't have the desire in my heart to be or motivated motivating me into holiness as soon as i read the word it just gets planted in there and i'm just like i want to be holy <laughs> you know so get the word in you you know the word will sow itself and the word will water its own seed I've experienced that. So, you know, I'm reading this and I'm just like, okay, yes, yes. Oh, I love it. Holiness. Just get in here, you know. So, um, 
It should excite you to discover ways to really be unspotted from the world. It should be exciting. I know a lot of us not going to be excited. I know y'all just like, hmm. <laughs> not me. <laughs> these pearls ain't going nowhere. <laughs> my grandmother gave me these pearls. I know God is not going to judge my girl, but my grandmother was a praying woman. <laughs> Yo, grandmother didn't know about earrings from the Marine Kingdom, so you need to take them off, okay? And go pawn them and go get you some new groceries for your Daniels. <laughs> right? Okay, so, um, yeah, the goal is to not look or be like them or anything that it stands for. So it may not even be always, like, a <sighs> fashion. When God talks about being unspotted by the world, he's talking about in ideologies, the, your thinking patterns, your beliefs, what the world itself represents. It's completely anti-Christ. So it's not just unspotted in physical appearance and what you wear and your fashion and stuff like that. It's everything. Everything the world represents as an anti-Christ, satanic ideology, government system. I mean, you be the complete opposite. God is going to bring you to a place where you are so consecrated unto him. He'll make sure that you are hated by the world. If the world still loves you, something is wrong. And how about this? If you do get people from the world that love you, it's because they receive Christ through you. So the scripture is still, is still, you know, true. If the world loves you, he says that. He says if the world receives you, then they're receiving their own. Or they don't receive you because if you were of the world, they would have received you. So if the world is still liking you, you know, it's something about you that's still, that's still like them. Because I can promise you, if you are 100% Christ and everything that you did, thought, and said, and imagined, and end, <laughs> they would not like you. Because not only would you convict them, but it just it just goes against their pride. You know, people are just setting their self will. They like the fact that they can do what they want to do. And when you are living and dressed in a way that completely defies everything that a sinner believes, they will not receive you. They don't like you. They don't. They may not even be convicted. Some people are so hard and hard. They don't need. They don't. Not that they're convicted by anything. They just don't even want it around them. People literally hate Jesus. They'll tell you bluntly, "I hate the God of the Bible." I hope Satan f's him in the booty. You know, like I, I see some crazy stuff on YouTube. Like I would love to see you tell Jesus this to his face. Like I just want to see him light you up. <laughs> like, bam. I and mean, it's just crazy how the people. How people just talk about the Lord. Like it's insane to me. But no, some people are not convicted by the word at all. Their hearts are so hard. They're wicked, honey. Those are evil people. They, they're they operating the Antichrist spirit. They have no fear of God. They just simply don't want anything about him around him. So they'll reject you for that reason. Talk to a Satanist about a Jesus or an atheist and see how they talk to you. And if you do have somebody who's not saved that is receiving you, honey, it's a possible brother or sister in the future that's right around there. You're like a second away from being saved. Or they just perceive the Christ in you. I don't even consider them being in the world. Simply because the world don't like Jesus. So people who do like Jesus, they're on the verge of getting saved to me. So, no. You don't want to look like them. You want to be completely unspotted from the ideologies that the world has. Thinking patterns. The way they do things. Their beliefs. Like gay marriage. No, that's just too obvious. A Christian thing wouldn't agree with that. Let's say something like they have a lot of humanistic views, just something that seems very general that you think God would kind of, that may be in the Bible, but they have a more like liberal, like philosophical version of it. Don't even have that. Oh, coloring your hair is artistic, you know? Like, you know, you just got to demonstrate God's creativity. No. they say they say stuff like um let's see unspotted by the world oh the famous don't judge them who are we to judge them let them live you know god i, I saw my cousin say the stupidest thing on facebook one day and you know what pisses me off about black people i know this is very stereotypical i can't stand to see a black person defy christ I know that every, I know it's, it's a, see, that's perfect right there. To see, what I just said is a perfect example of having an ideology like the world or 
always believing that because a black person grew up in church that they should know better because obviously you may not be a christian but you learned a little bit about the bible you'll find some people in the world that are black honey they know about enough about the devil to be like nah i ain't i ain't messing with that man nah, i learned the church <laughs> you know they'll start saying like that so it's just kind of like she said something so dumb i'm not gonna say who it was but i was on facebook and i saw it she's not saved this girl, I think when they was like legalizing gay marriage or something, I see so many Christians, you know, she said in a very politically correct way. I see so many Christians, you know, just beating down on homosexuals. And, you know, um, God says that we should love people. And if God, you know, I'm just like, God, God, God hold on a second. What God are you talking about? The people have the nerve to speak for God when he clearly is against this stuff in his word. I'm like, y'all, do you read the Bible? Don't be trying to be a spokesman for my Lord defending this mess to make people feel better. And God, she's rebuking Christians with scripture about homosexuality. I mean, sounding dumb. As dumb it can be. I was glad I didn't have a Facebook page. I would have got on there and just tore, because I used to do stuff like that. I had I could pull scriptures from like like I had wardrobes in my closet, honey. I could pull the shirt down, the skirt, the jeans. I would come with so many scriptures to slay you on your own Facebook page and leave you for dead. You wouldn't come back for two weeks after I slayed you. I'm serious. But I read that and I'm just like, is she stupid? I mean, people actually do. You are speaking for God, saying how. He supports gay marriage because he's a God of love and he doesn't judge people. Are you dumb? It's a serious question. You have to be. You clearly have not read the Bible. I don't know which God you're talking about, but I hate the fact that she even spoke for him because the people who read that mess who don't know anything about God probably believed it. Well, I got a rude awakening for you, honey. Go read the Old Testament and you will see how God feels about homosexuality. All, all that love and peace and no judgment. No, no, no. I said, Lord, this child, Satan done chopped off this child's mind and just took, I don't know, Satan just be doing some, I think he, I think Satan takes the top of people's heads off and pisses in it. 